Hello everyone and welcome to another Camera Jabber video. Today I'm speaking to Tracy Calder who is the co-founder of the Close-Up Photographer of the Year Awards. Hi Tracy, how are you? Hi Angela, thanks for having me on, I'm good thanks. Good, lovely to see you. And you. Now Close-Up Photographer of the Year, you, when did that start? Well, um, it started launched in 2018. Um, we had the idea about two years before, but it took us about two years to get around to work out what we were going to do about it. So 2018 was the first, the first one. Yeah, and, and so the, the deadline for the competition this year is coming up quite fast, isn't it? It is. It's May the 17th, that's Sunday, midnight on Sunday, May the 17th. Okay, so could you just sort of give a little bit of background to the competition and how people enter and that kind of thing? Yeah, sure. Um, basically, uh, it's uh, a celebration of micro, macro and close-up photography. So we're grouping those three areas uh, together. Um, and the idea of the competition came about because I'm a huge fan of close-up, have been for 20 odd years. Um, and I just felt that there wasn't anything out there. There's, there's different competitions that have, um, you know, categories for close-up, but there wasn't anything celebrating it as a separate entity. And I really felt that it, it, it should be celebrated because there are a lot of amazing people out there doing incredible work. Um, and it would be nice to get them all together and, and showcase that, that work, really. Um, so it's, it's incredibly easy to enter, really. You just need to go onto the website, which is uh, cupotti.com. Um, and you, uh, you, you, there is an entry fee. Uh, the young close-up photographer of the year is £5. And then the other entry fee start, uh, starts at £10, right up to the point where you can enter 30 photographs, which is £4. Um, and you can enter um, pictures across all of the categories. There are seven categories. Um, and basically you pay, then you think about what you want to do, you get your files prepared and then you upload them. But you don't have to pay and upload at the same time. You can do that later, the uploading. Okay, great. Could you just say again how much it was for 30 images? Because the yeah, sure. Zoom did it's 40, a flip. Yeah, sure. £40, 40 pounds for 30 images or one image is £10 and there are two stages in between as well. Great. Okay. Well, that all sounds very reasonable. So um, now you've got a few tips for people who are thinking about maybe entering. I have, yes. I think there are certain areas of close-up photography that people find particularly challenging. Um, and I've got a few photographs, examples from last year's competition that kind of address some of those key areas. And I think, um, to begin with, I think there's the research and the inspiration side. And I think sometimes people get a bit stuck and they think, oh, you know, I've got to go to a, an exotic location or something to get an amazing picture. Um, but with close-up, the joy of that is you could get a shot of a cheese grater in the kitchen that's incredible and looks space age. Um, mm. So I think there's the research and inspiration side. I think people often struggle with the lighting aspect of close-up. Um, focusing and maximising depth of field is also an issue for some people. Um, and I do think, um, you know, I think keeping the subject still and keeping the camera still, obviously a huge issue sometimes. So we've got a few tips based around those key areas that can be quite challenging. Um, so do you, want, do you want me to go into the first one? And pause that would be the, great, yes. Show, my, show my screen. screen. Okay, so this one um, was taken by Jo Angel, um, and she took this shot of a zebra spider in her back garden. And I think for me, what this sums up is the whole um, idea that you can get some incredible pictures literally in your house or metres away from the front door. And she went out in the garden to photograph some bees, um, sat for a little while and, and watched everything sort of, you know, watch these little spiders going in and out of the, the bamboo canes and watching the bees going in and out of the bamboo canes. And that spider is only is seven millimetres big. I mean, that's quite incredible. Wow. And I think what I love about it's that cute. is... The it really that, looks... Sorry to interrupt. It's, it's so cute. It just looks like he's sort of thinking about making a jump or something, looking <laughs> down. <laughs> but he looks like he's peeking out to say hello. And, and yeah. he's just so... The colour of him is perfect against the colour of the bamboo canes as well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so I think, yeah, this is an interesting way of showing how staying local, you, you know, mm. really doesn't have to restrict you, quite the opposite. And I think if you, restri you restrict yourself and say, OK, I'm only going to photograph in this one square metre of the garden, that's actually better for close up photography because you can spend more time just analysing a very, very sort of small patch. Um, mm. And Joe took this with a, a Canon EOS 70 uh, Mark II and she used a, a Sigma 105, which I have to say, even though my Sigma 105 is 15 years old now, I still love it. I still think it's a fantastic optic for, for close-up photography. Um, so yeah, so I think, it's, you know, I think it's a good example of not having to go far. And also the composition of it as well, because a lot of people with close-up, you've got so much other stuff to worry about, like the lighting, focusing, etc. that composition sometimes goes out the window. But mm -hmm. all of the traditional rules of composition, you know, rule of thirds, leading lines, etc., they still apply to close-up. So it's important not to forget about those when you're trying to to frame something yeah. up. 
The other thing that strikes me about that image actually is, you know, um, when people are talking about um, wedding photography and oh, yeah. portrait, outdoor portrait photography, they often talk about standing people in doorways so the natural light comes in front. Yeah, know, yeah, yeah. You've got exactly the same thing. It's just a little spider in there. Yeah, it's, it's great, isn't it? And this was one of my favourites actually from last year. I really hoped that it was going to do well because I was really excited <laughs> when I saw it and it did. So <laughs> great. that was really great. So that's the first, that's the first one. If we go to the next one I want to talk about, and this one um, was by Edward Giesbers. Uh, I apologise to Edward if I spelt his name, um, said his name incorrectly, but there you go. And this is an orange, orange tip butterfly that he took in his local nature reserve. And I think what this one for me illustrates is that for close up, I think it's really, really important to get to know your subject as much as possible. So if you're gonna photograph a butterfly, um, you know, you won't do any good going out in the middle of the daytime when the sun's up and, and the butterflies are warm and you know you're snapping away trying to chase them round. That's not really the approach that you need to take. You need to kind of go the night before, see where the butterfly might be roosting, maybe have a look and then return before sunrise um, to, but while they're warming up. Um, so a close-up photographer is I think you know learning how an, an animal behaves or even a plant. I think some people plants do it's good to go in all seasons and see a plant when it doesn't have uh, any flowers on it or see where the light might be good in a forest or whatever. Just do, do your homework, you know, do some research and really, uh, you know, really get your ID guide out because that always adds to the interest anyhow. I think learning about something is always really beneficial. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think insects, definitely you need to know what plants they like to eat, where they roost at night, that sort of thing plants when are they at their best because close up if you shoot a flower and it's got some blemishes or tears on it unless that's part of your picture it really will be magnified and you will see every single speck on it um so yeah finding a pristine subject like this one i mean it's absolutely beautiful isn't it and he's got a lovely bouquet coming from the lens there which is fantastic and he's taken it in the morning you've got the dew drops and, and again the composition is really good i think it's a really striking shot and backlit as well yeah absolutely really I mean, backlit, you know backlit for the wings is perfect and the same treatment for leaves or foliage is always really good mm. um because i think lighting it it can be an issue um, but we'll, there's a picture later on where we'll, we'll talk about various ways that you can light your subject um, but yeah, I just think it's a really striking picture. And I think it shows he knows how that butterfly behaves. He knows when it comes out, you know, when it's going to be its best. Um, and yeah. that really does make a difference. It really does. Yeah. And actually, I really love the fact that it's making something of the uh, environment. Absolutely. Does. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's what's interesting. You know, if we talk about sort of gear with close-up photography. I think people sometimes can get a bit put off because they think the gear is really expensive. You've got to have a dedicated macro lens, you, mm. you know, but you, you actually, when I started out, I didn't have a macro lens. I just had one of the screw-on filters that you can use to, to reduce the minimum focusing distance. Yeah. And it cost me, I bought it in a charity shop, it cost me four pounds. Mm. So, you know, there are various ways of using bellows, extension tubes, etc. And this is a good example, and there's another one later on, of showing, you know, you can take some cracking shots with telephoto lenses, wide angle lenses. It still counts as close up. It doesn't mean you have to use a macro lens. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good point, actually, Angie. Yeah, I think, I think that showing a sense of the environment, especially with animals, is really, yeah. really good. Yeah. yeah, but it helps convey the fact that it is kind of warming up after sure. a cold night isn't it as well yeah lovely yeah no it is lovely so our next one uh, is who is my next one? Oh yeah this is i find this one really funny i like this one this is um a cactus and oh, it was it? uh yeah it's a cactus and it was taken by andrew wilson and what i love about this is it really struck me when i saw it when i was judging the competition and the the contrasting you know the colors the green and the red together are really striking and when after the event once the competition was closed we got captioned you know full captions of people and he was explaining to me that his partner and himself had just applied for a mortgage this has got relevance <laughs> <laughs> just applied for a mortgage and that red banking folder was just lying around the house and he thought oh that would make a great background so it's actually a folder yeah behind it and i think one of the other areas to talk about is backgrounds really um and that people you know you don't have to have uh, expensive backdrops. I mean, he'll say he used a bank folder. I've got these things here, which I love, which I'll just hold up before you can't see it. You can put the screen up. But there's um, photo boards I like, which are kind of like laminated flat uh, backdrops that cost about, I don't know, 18, 19 quid, something like that. Mm. 
they're brilliant. Um, and then, you know, you could use anything. I mean, I've with people in the competition, I think uh, Padita, who you, you may well know her stuff, um, she, uh, she used her camera bag, the black of her camera bag as a backdrop when she was photographing a plant outside. So, yeah. you know, I think the important thing to... I've done in the past is, is uh, print off some, you know, print off an out of focus photo of a lawn or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of a, 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 a soft green and then put that behind a plant where it's maybe got some ugly background. Absolutely. Now that's a really good idea. And I know a number of people that do that. It's a really good idea because then you can control that aspect of it perfectly yeah. because you'll often find something that's absolutely beautiful, but there's so much vegetation or whatever behind that makes it very messy. Um, so yeah, that's a really good tip actually, and should do that. And I think what people need to realise with close up is that the background you need to give it equal consideration to the subject because a messy background will just destroy a close up picture. Mm. But you've really got to think how does that background complement the, the subject, whether it be in colour like this or shape, or whether it be the natural environment. Um, so yeah, background is you know really crucial. So that's that. Yeah, that's very good to. I think you're right. Printing something out is good, or buying a, a man, you know, buying a, mm. a backdrop. And this is Andrew Wheatley. And this was the shot of the fern. Um, and what I liked about this is I think this shows the idea of that, um, that you shouldn't forget about the traditional compositional rules when you're shooting close up, because he's perfectly leading that eye in and across to the corner there. Mm. Um, and it's almost like, um, it reminds me of a painting really. It's got that kind of moodiness to it, hasn't it? Yeah, it's beautiful. But he had spent, I think, I think he said he spent a couple of weeks trying to find the perfect fern in the woods. Uh, so we didn't just stumble across this. Obviously, you put a yeah. lot of thought into it. And I think that's, again, have a look, take a notebook, make a note. This looks good, but it will look even better in a week when it's unfurled a bit mm -hmm. more or whatever. You know, do, do revisit the same place over and over again. Do you know, did he photograph that in situ or did he? He did. That one was in situ. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What he did is he photographed it in situ and then in Photoshop, he darkened and, uh, you know, darkened mm -hmm. the background to get rid of some of the vegetation. Yeah. And then he, he lightened the highlights up so that they mm -hmm. were, you know, directing the eye in that fashion. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was in situ, that one, definitely. Um, yeah, and I think some people, what I find interesting with plant photographers in particular, is they really, um, you know, a lot of them grow the plants themselves as well. You know, if they want to photograph a great hyacinth next year, they plant it and they wait a year. So it's not a, it's not a technique where you rush things. <laughs> 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 definitely not. So that was the other Andrew. And then we've got one of um, Mandy Dishes here. And Mandy, you know, a lot of people know her for her light box and light pad photography. Um, but this one, um, I thought this one was taken in situ, but actually Mandy did take this back to back indoors because with plant photography, obviously wind is a huge issue, especially with a delicate flower like a stitch wall, which is what this is. Um, so and anything I'd say above 10 miles per hour and you're going to need some sort of supports to hold that flower steady because they will just, it, once you're magnified, they will be whipping around mm. in the frame. Um, so, and, um, so actually Mandy, um, she used focus stacking for this, which is something that a lot of close-up photographers use to maximise depth of field. Um, so yeah, so she picked this one, took it indoors, that green backdrop, I think that's from, I think that's a window behind that right. she had. Um, and then obviously with a flower like that, I mean, it would be very difficult to capture that in situ without using a windbreak or something really, mm. you know. So, I mean, even though she's focus stacked, the, the focus is still very, very shallow. Very narrow, yeah. And that's a really good point, actually, because I think that's the one thing that people struggle with the most with close up to begin with, is that, even, you know, even if you put it up to F22 or whatever, your, your zone of acceptable sharpness is going to be incredibly narrow because obviously you're very close to the subject. Um, so your your depth of field will be incredibly narrow. Um, so you, you've got to work with that a bit because you can focus stack, um, but sometimes it's quite nice, even if you have focus stacks like Mandy, that you've still got that blurriness to it. Mm. Um, so yeah, so she's, I think this might have been, I don't think it was a combination of a huge amount of files. I think it was only like four. And with mm. focus stacking people, we often use 40, 60, 90 yeah. files. Um, but it's just very striking because I think she would have had trouble getting, I think they're called anthers, aren't they? The yellow. Yeah. Um, I think she would have had trouble getting both of those and the little bit in the middle sharp if she hadn't used focus stacking. Yes, and, and because these, that's a tiny flower, isn't it? Yeah, it's about five, about the size of five pea piece, the stitch work. Right, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so that's, yeah, yeah it, is, it is beautiful, but it is, it, it is challenging. And I would say with, in terms of keeping the subject study, uh, steady, 
Um, I've used um, like garden canes and tied things to them with floristry wire or uh, perhaps a thing called a Wimbley clamp that, uh, that will yeah. hold a, a thicker stem, um, you know, steady, or just look for plants that have a thicker stem, like tulips, for instance, they mm. don't tend to go everywhere quite so easily. Um, and that's so, always yeah. quite challenging as well, isn't it? Because obviously in the process of clamping, you don't want to end up crushing the stem. So as you're close to clamping, over time, you just realise it's wilting. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, the Wimbley clamp has got the little clip on the end, the crocodile clip, has an adjustable sort of grip. I mean, you probably know right. that, but it has an mm -hmm. adjustable grip where you can literally make it hold onto the flower quite delicately. Yeah. Because obviously anything, you, if you, especially if you're out in the woods or something, if you put a cut a garden cane in, tied something up, obviously you really do need to make sure that you remove everything and you leave the flower as you found it. Um, yes. So, yeah, so I think, you know, I think the, the Wimbley plant's quite good like that because it's quite a delicate hold. Um, mm. like if you try and hold it steady, you will never get that kind of... <laughs> <No>. <laughs> It is fun to look through the, the, the viewfinder as you're trying that though. You think it's really fun. <laughs> well, like, yeah, I was quite surprised actually looking at last year's entries. Um, when I looked at the EXIF data for quite a lot of them um, and people were, you know, uh, people were adding their little details in the caption. I was quite surprised how many of them were actually handheld. Because right. normally my thing with close up would just say to anybody, do not handhold, use a tripod. But mm -hmm. it is incredible the pictures people are getting by handholding. I guess it just depends how steady you are, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how many coffees you've had. Exactly, yeah, exactly. But I like to use a tripod and I like to use one with a, um, a central column that can be positioned at 90 degrees because I shoot down on a lot of things. So I, I quite like that flexibility. Yeah. So I've got um, a micro positioning plate. Have you tried one of those? Yes, I have. They're brilliant. Oh, it's so handy, isn't it? Because you can just twist a, you know, a little turn and it just moves by a fraction of Absolutely. a minute. Absolutely. And in fact, if you're doing focus stacking, you need one of those anyhow, mm. really. I mean, because um, as you say, when you're moving just like a millimetre at a time, it's surprising how that changes the whole picture. I mean, yeah. it's just in macro, it's, it's game changing, isn't it, really? Mm. So that's Mandy. Uh, and then he was next. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is quite a good. This is, in fact, this, this marries up with what we've just been talking about. Whoops which is the focus stacking. Yeah, this is focus stacked. And this is a fox glove, um, which was taken by uh, Sierra, uh, Sierra? Sarah Fiona Helm. Uh, and this is where you use focus stacking to get that you know, maximum sharpness mm. and maximum depth of field. And not many people look inside a fox glove. They like it, but obviously they're drooping yeah. down, aren't they? So yeah. it's, it's quite hard to, to get inside one and, and get that kind of clarity. That's a um, shot. It's got a space age, space age sense about it, hasn't it? Yeah, it does. It does, actually. And I think that's what's great. A lot of close-up, you look at it and you think, oh, my God, it looks like something from another planet, like an alien mm. or something. <laughs> but it must have been still quite quite delicate work because she was using a Nikon 100mm lens and to get, to get that, you know, right into the mouth of the flower. Yeah. Um, and she used um, Helicon Focus uh, to stack, to blend the images together, which is quite a popular program for yes. focus stacking. Um, and that was, oh yeah, so that was nine exposures combined for that one. Right. Yeah, and you can see right down the sort of the throat of the flower is, yes. is sharp and those anthers are just sharp as, enough as well, aren't they? They are, absolutely. And I think what's good about it as well is that, as you just said, to be able to see down the throat of the flower, you're kind of getting a bug's eye view, aren't you, really? Mm. A bee, you're an insect with C. Yeah. Um, and I think when you're shooting close up, and, and especially when you're shooting plants, it's quite a good attitude to adopt is just to think of yourself as a bug. Mm you know, lay down on the ground, look up into a flower, really get down low um, and really think, that, you know, imagine that you're inside that flower and you'll get a much better picture, I think. Mm. And then we've got, that's Sophia Spurgeon, that's a um, cherry blossom flower. Beautiful. And yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? Because it's very delicate and it's, um, and what I find interesting as well is that she used a backdrop, which is what you were just talking about as well. Mm. Um, yeah, so she used a backdrop behind it to, to marry, um, you know, the colour of the in, inside of the flower with the backdrop. Um, and she used something called um, a Lumimuse, a Manfrotto Lumimuse, mm -hmm. to light up the underside of the flower. And that's something that I, I use quite a lot. Um, yeah. And I, I don't shoot with flash, um, so I tend to use uh, continuous light sources like the Lumimuse, where I can see exactly where the shadows are going to fall and where I'm, you know, where I'm revealing detail. Um, and the Lumimuse, um, it's, it's not expensive. And I think, they, I think you can get them with sort of nine LEDs now and they're adjustable. 
Um, and they're quite small as well, so they're really useful for, you know, delicate situations where you, so you can just pop them under a, you could literally get them under a daisy, couldn't you? Absolutely, yeah, you get them under a daisy. I use them a lot for, um, for fungi, actually, because obviously you're trying to take a picture of a mushroom and, and often the, un the underneath is so dark, so they're really good for that. And obviously it's daylight balance, so you're not getting any issues with white balance or colour casts. Mm. Um, yeah, so she used that to light up underneath. Um, and this is a, from the cherry tree that was in her garden, I think. So again, it's that whole idea of staying local and getting to know your own little miniature yeah. area. And she actually used a Lens Baby Velvet 56, which I know Sophia's a real fan of. Yeah. Um, which gives that softness, doesn't it? And it gives that yeah, a certain look. Very painterly, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah, very painterly. And she combined this, this again, even though you wouldn't think to look at it, this again is a combination of two different uh, photographs. So uh, she used, one, one of the photographs was taken at F2.8, uh, obviously the back flower, and the, the foreground flower was F11. So oh, and she's combined yeah. those two. So even though you're looking at that picture and you wouldn't think you'd need to do that, um, actually to get, to, get, to get the second flower in focus at all at that sort of proximity, mm -hmm. she's had to combine two different apertures. Um, so yeah, so that's quite interesting in that sense. Beautiful. Yeah, it is lovely. And then we've got Rachel, uh, and this was um, Rachel Chapel, and this is a photograph of an iris. And I thought it'd be interesting just to look at it because um, in close up, I think where you focus obviously makes such a huge difference that wherever the contrast is greatest, i.e. where the focus is, that's where someone's eye is going to go first, isn't it? We know that in any photograph. But in close up, I'd say it's more important than ever where you direct that person's eye. So to direct it, most people will probably have gone for the yellow, you know, where the, mm. the mid centre of the iris is. But Rachel has gone for that lovely edge there, that lovely lip, because she wanted to give the impression that it was almost like a wave sort of crashing, yeah. and then you've got the yellow of the sand behind. Um, so yeah, so you've got to, your focusing has got to be spot on with close up. Mm. And obviously most cameras will offer you a variety of settings to use, but I, I personally like to use manual when I'm shooting close up. I very rarely use auto. Um, and and I think, yeah, I think if you'd use auto, it would have gone straight to the center of the flower there really. Yeah. And when you uh, focus manually, I don't know whether you use an SLR or a mirrorless camera, do you, do you tend to magnify the view? I do absolutely. Yeah, I use a, I use a, um, I've got a Fuji XT2, right? Um, and I do. I use all of the focusing aids on that that are available to me. But I, I quite like the split screen aid. I quite like that. Um, I don't use the kind of zebra peaking and stuff like that very much. But I do. You, you know, if there are focusing aids available to you on your camera, explore them all, try them all out because one of yeah. them will really work. But magnifying the view is the, the best, definitely the best so option. If someone's using um, an SLR. Yeah, I, I would recommend that they, they try um, live view. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That will enable them to magnify, won't it? Yes, definitely. I think all, I mean, I don't shoot anything with close up anymore that isn't on live view, really. What I'll do is I'll set it up, I'll get it already on live view, but then I will look through the viewfinder because I find if I do that at the last minute, then I can, it makes it easier to check the edges of the frame for me because I can block everything else out. So I can yeah. have one final look, check the edges, make sure there's no debris or vegetation or whatever. And then I'll go back again and go back onto the, you know, the screen. Um, so yes, I think that's a really good point, Angela. I do see it as a wave. You, you said the yellow is the, as the sand. I see it as the sun coming up behind a wave. Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I think you're right. It's, it's, and I think it's the lovely. square crop is quite nice as well. Yeah. Actually. yeah. It's quite nice and tight, isn't it? It's got yeah. that nice. Yeah. Fantastic. And I think that that one was with the one a uh, Nikon 105. Um, and it was only about 4.5. And you can see again, you know, how quickly that focusing falls away. Mm. It's incredible, isn't it? Yeah. That is macro for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, what I liked about this actually, and it's what I meant to mention, is that she used, um, to reflect some light into the iris, she actually used a small beer mat that was covered in tin foil. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice and handy. You could pop that in your, your camera bag and carry it around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the great things about macro and close up is just that there's so many homemade gadgets. I just love hearing people just say, oh, yeah, you know, I used the bottom of a cake tin to reflect the light or, mm -hmm. or I made my own. Um, you know, some people, when they're arranging flowers, they'll put masking tape like in a grid shape over a vase so you can put the stems in and keep them right. separate and yes. keep them straight. So people have all these kind of DIY approaches to close up, which is brilliant. Brilliant. I love it. <laughs> very clever. Yeah, it's very clever. 
and then this one um, is uh, from Ellen Ellen Woods, um, and I can't pronounce this properly. I'll have a go. It's a, a red trillium, which probably is completely not the way you say it, but there you go. Um, and I think what's interesting, she used a Luma Muse again mm -hmm. to reflect some light under, and it looks. I think again, like you said, about giving some context uh, mm -hmm. with that wide angle lens has given it really good context. And it doesn't matter that the trees are leaning in. In fact, I think that that adds to it a bit. Mm, yeah, I think so. So she used a Luma Muse underneath uh, for that. And I think she used a flash. Yes, yeah, she did. She used um, the Nikon you know, macro flashes, the SB200 flashes mm -hmm. for this. So what looks like quite a simple picture, she's actually put a lot of thought into, you know, to get the light balanced the way she wanted it. She had to use quite a few extra sources and, um, mm. you know, build up. She's done a great up. job of getting a nice natural looking light, though. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think that is the, the skill of someone who really knows how to use lighting. Mm. Um, because I, like I say, I don't use flashes and it's an area that I, I probably will get into. Um, but at the moment, I'm quite happy just manipulating light, you know, natural daylight. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, eventually I will learn how to do this properly. <laughs> Maybe she can teach me. I'll have to ask her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a beautiful photo. Yeah, it is. It is lovely. And again, she'd been to this woodland a hundred times you know I mean she really knows her stuff so I think it's that whole idea of just go back and it was not quite right don't take the picture just go back mm. another day keep returning. Um, Do you know whether her camera was just resting on the ground or has she got a, a mini tripod or something? That's a very good point she used a gorilla pod for this one. Oh right okay. Yeah and, and gorilla pods obviously are brilliant for this kind of work because you can adjust them so easily so flexible aren't they? Um, yeah. And then a lot of people in macro use Gorilla Pods. Then you can use the Gorilla Pod to hold the little Luminous light mm. as well. Um, and you can wrap them around branches and things, can't you? So they're mm. perfect for this. Perfect. Um, I guess another option would be to invert the column on your tripod if you can and have your camera upside down. Absolutely. Yeah, you could do that. Or I use a bean bag a lot, actually, I have to say. Right, yeah. Keeps um, your camera a bit cleaner and you can nestle it in. Yeah, definitely. And I, I mean, obviously you are more restricted in terms of height and things with that, you know, how, you know, what you can do. Mm. Um, but yeah, I always carry a beanbag and I, you know, my beanbag is filthy because it just gets laid down in the new forest quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, people have got until the 17th. Yeah, they got to the 17th of May and the top prize is £2,500 and um, a trophy. Uh, and the young uh, close-up photographer year gets two Sigma lenses. Um, and yeah, and, and the category winners get £300 each as well, which obviously adds on to the top prize too. Um, uh -huh. And yeah, I mean, last year we had more than sort of 3,000 entries. And, and this year at the moment, it's looking about the same, if not slightly higher, which considering the circumstances is, is you know, pretty good. We're very pleased. And I'm very excited because I'm not allowed to look at any of them yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. You must be looking forward to being able to open the folder on the 18th. I am. I am. Dan, Dan strips all the names out so I can't see them, you see. So okay. he, just, he just goes, ooh, now and again. I go, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that'll be great fun. Yeah, it's really good fun. And we've got some great judges as well. We've got, um, we've got Ross Hoddenot, who obviously knows his stuff with the insects. We've got Matt Dugu. We've got Keith Wilson. There's me. Uh, there's Sue Bishop, and then we've got Robert Thompson and David Maitland, and we really need all of those guys because their their areas of expertise are are fantastic. You know, someone like David Maitland, like my ex area of expertise is not micro photography. I'm not, I don't use microscopes. So to have someone like him on board who really knows what's a good picture and what isn't in that field yeah. is invaluable. So that's fantastic. Yes, because it's very easy in those situations to get pulled in by something you haven't seen before. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And also there's the, the whole ethical aspect as well, because, you know, we really, we really don't want anybody to go out and, and you know, hurt an insect or an animal in any way to take a photograph. Mm. So um, someone like me might have suspicions about a picture and think, oh, is, is that set up? Is that you know, animal doesn't look very comfortable or whatever. But the people we've got on board, some of them have been chosen because they really know when an animal looks like it's in distress or an insect looks distressed and they will instantly tell us, no, that's not right. And, and that's really helpful, I think, because we really want to be careful and cautious about it. No, I think that's a really good point um, because you don't want to be putting images out and saying this is a fantastic image and actually the people who are in the know think, well, that's not acceptable. 
absolutely and it is quite hard because someone like me would look at a picture of a wasp or something and would think oh that's lovely you know and then someone like Ross or Matt in particular might come forward and say actually I can tell just by the way that that antenna is bent that that animal has been put in the, has been chilled in the freezer or something because right. obviously many years ago especially in Victorian times that was incredibly common and yeah. now there you know there are still people that do practice that sort of technique and obviously it's not something that we want to be encouraging um, so it's really handy. Some of the people that we've asked to be on board, they really do know. They can tell in, a, in an instant if something has been, you know, hard in some way. So that's quite important for us, definitely. Yeah, that's good to know. And when will you announce the winners? Well, hopefully the shortlist will be um, in the summer and mm -hmm. then the winner will be September. Um, but okay. the shortlist, we, we do a top 100 uh, and that's quite exciting because everyone gets a nice buzz around that. And it's, you know, the, it's really lovely to look at that top 100 because the variety in it is, is so mm -hmm. exciting and really, really joyful. Um, and then the, the overall win will be September. OK, so when you get down to your 100 winners, you you don't decide the winner until much later on you, you kind of whip well it. no not really i mean the thing is all of the judging at the moment is done remotely which is quite useful in the current situation um so we kind of get points off the judges and things and then you know then we there's quite a bit of to and froing that goes on so we mm -hmm. the top 100 is selected then there's more toing and froing more toing and froing until we eventually settle on it and it does actually take quite a long time the, pro the process um you know we, we might have to ask an entrant, you know, to clarify something or ask about something like the ethics behind something. So, it, you know, there is a delay and we quite like that top 100 being quite separate and then the winner coming with a bit of a gap in between, so. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And I think, you know, it's nice for everyone to enjoy those 100 images. Yeah, decide, yeah. Which one would they pick as the winner? Yeah, well, that's something hopefully we might be able to do this year is have a people's choice because I always love that with Wildlife Photography for the Year when they have the people's choice um, and we asked the judges to choose their, you know, their, their ultimate picture of the 100. It was quite interesting. And three of them chose the same picture. So that was really interesting. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, that's always nice to know, isn't it? Even if you didn't win, to know that your, your image had been chosen by one of the judges would be nice. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And, and they've all got very different backgrounds. And I think that's what you know about judging as well, is that, you know, every, you, you come to the table with your own background and your own preferences. And in a way, you have to park that sometimes and just start with a fresh slate, don't you? And, and look at yeah. each picture as if you've never, as if you don't know anything about it. Yeah. Um, so it's good fun. It's exciting. Great. Well, thanks very much for joining me, Tracy. It's been really interesting hearing from you. Great. Thank you, Ange. Thanks for having me on. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Stay safe.